Thank you very much for being with us on this lovely, warm Friday afternoon. My name is Liviu Mate. I am the head of ECS, the School of Education, Communication and Society here at King's. I am under very strict direction to start with some uh, housekeeping uh, announcement as, and in good uh, disciplined KCL soldier, I'm going to do that. The first thing I uh, have to tell you all is that this event is being recorded. There will also be a photographer taking pictures during the event. If you don't want to appear in any of the photographs or video recording, please indicate that to my, my colleague, Cleo uh, Faturecci at the, at the end of the room, and we will make sure that, uh, that you don't. The recording will be available after the, the meeting uh, on the website of, uh, of this um, series. Uh, after the, the lecture, we will have uh, a discussion, perhaps more than just questions and answers and a dialogue, there will be, and then there will be a, a small uh, reception. There is no fire drill planned for today, so if we hear the alarm, we, we have to quit the, the room there. So this is the end of the housekeeping um, announcement. So once again, I wanted to thank you all for being here with us, whether in person here in the Great Hall or online joining from many parts of the world from Canada to Hong Kong, I am, I am told. This year's uh, ECS annual lecture, which is part of our Education and Society Dialogue series, will be delivered by Dame Louise Richardson, whom I would like to welcome most warmly. The topic is, as you can see, how can universities address the crisis in democracy? Please allow me to say a few words about ECS, the Education and Society Dialogue Series, and about our reasoning and motivation when suggesting today's broader theme, which is universities and democracy. ECS engages in pluridisciplinary research, advanced teaching and learning, and service under the unifying umbrella of education, communication, and society. ECS constitutes a rather rare, if not unique, institutional intellectual configuration, bringing together in one place education, social sciences, humanities, and public policy. We are an integral part of the Faculty of Social Sciences and Public Policy. Currently, we are in the middle of a renewed process of reflection, planning, and action about how to develop the school so that to serve even better and maybe even more directly, King's College as its School of Education and Society, serve better London, the UK, and other constituencies internationally as well. Our ambition is to be an anchor institution for defined constituencies out there in the real world, and at the same time, a pace setter in selected areas of academic and professional expertise. By being a pace setter, we mean proposing, testing, and perhaps showing the way regarding how to understand and address ongoing and new challenges in education and society. The tools we employ to achieve all this include a systematic attempt to identify important themes and issues, put them on the academic and public agendas, and work with others in designing and implementing approaches to address them, including sometimes concrete solutions. Education and Society Dialogue series is such a tool. The series was launched last year and is imagined as a platform allowing us from ECS to come together with colleagues from King's, from other London and UK higher education institutions, with members of the academic community from elsewhere in the world, and also with policymakers, even politicians, media representatives and others who should have a voice and who have a responsibility and a role to play in addressing current and emerging challenges in education and society. Now, speaking of coming together, I want to thank once again all KCL colleagues who are here with us today. It is an honor to see our Vice President for International Relations, she, she's there, Professor Funmi Olinisakin, a great supporter of our school and also of the cause of international education. I would also like to acknowledge and thank the fellow heads of school from our faculty who are here today, Bobby Duffy, Director of the Policy Institute at King's, and John Gerson, Head of Security Studies. 
The previous topics in the Education and Society Dialogue series were higher education and knowledge as a public good, and higher education and science diplomacy in times of peace and war. In addition, during the current academic year, we had the opportunity to contribute to and influence the debate regarding another important issue of global relevance for higher education and society, academic freedom. ECS organized the King's Presidential Series on Reimagining Academic Freedom, which is becoming an ambitious international project under the leadership of our president and principal, Professor Shitish Kapoor. Now, allow me to list just a few questions that exemplify our interest in the relationship between universities and democracy and in the contribution of universities to democracy. I hope these questions will illustrate how today's theme fits within the context of education and society dialogues. I will not attempt to answer any of these questions, just list them. They are something like this. Do universities have an obligation, a duty to democracy? What is that duty? What does it even mean for a university to have a duty to democracy? If there is such a duty, is it to be fulfilled simply by research and scholarship on democracy, like political scientists do for a living? Or is it transcends into other areas, including education, and possibly even beyond just the social sciences? Is there a need for former frameworks of reference to, in, to inform our work and support our work regarding education for democracy in the university? If at all, should they be intellectual frameworks developed by independent scholars? Should they rather be pedagogic frameworks developed by those interested in issues of curriculum and pedagogy? Or should they be education policy frameworks developed with the participation of public authorities or, God forbid, by regulators? Is it the case that we are living in times not only of crisis of in democracy itself, but also of a recession, maybe even a crisis with regard to the interest of the university in democracy altogether? A lot has been written in the last several years in the US about a related concept, that of a civic recession in higher education. Should universities try to advance the cause of democracy in practice, hands-on, outside the walls of the university, beyond just research and education? And should universities themselves function as model, models of democracy? Many think and assert that universities are not and cannot be democracies. Now, all in all, our interest as a school of education and society is about how to think, or maybe think anew about universities and democracy, and how to act on that, including from the perspective of the educational mission of the university. There is no better thinker, intellectual leader, higher education and public personality trailblazer to lead us in this discussion than Dame Louise Richardson. A scholar of terrorism, she has conducted extensive and transformational research at Harvard for about 20 years, at St. Andrews and Oxford. She initiated and completed transformational initiatives in teaching and learning as well, not just in research. Many of us, irrespective of our own discipline, will know her books, What Terrorists Want, Understanding the Enemy, Containing the Threat, the Roots of Terrorism, or Democracy and Counterterrorism Lessons from the Past. Dame Richardson is a serial glass ceiling breaker, if I may put it so. And she has a formidable record in leading others in breaking thick glass ceilings, in addressing major challenges more broadly within and beyond higher education, such as those brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. Dame Richardson was the first female vice, uh, vice chancellor at St. Andrew, the first female vice chancellor of Oxford, that is the first to put it in perspective, the first woman to lead this premier university in almost a thousand years. She is now the first woman to take the helm of Carnegie Corporation of New York since Andrew Carnegie established this foundation in 1911. As an independent higher education researcher and also as someone who had a chance to work for a while with Dame Richardson, I can attest to many initiatives, efforts, novel ideas and hard work which speak for her dedication to higher education, to democracy and to university and democracy. 
I first met Dame Richardson when she engaged openly on the first line of the front for defense of academic freedom in the case of Central European University. Last year, when I wrote to invite Professor Richardson, then still at Oxford, to this lecture, I lamented a little in my email letter, saying that she would be only a few months in a new job with a lot on her plate, and of course I would understand if she couldn't come and just turn us down. The response came within about two hours, and it basically said, what do you mean I have a lot on my plate? Of course that will be the case, but this is an important topic important for me, and you should know that I have been waiting a long time for a chance to debate about it. Louise, thank you so much for coming. We are very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Livy, for that generous introduction. And just to say that uh, I was long an admirer of Livy's extraordinary work at that uh, institution, the Central European University, which is a university that has stood for democracy its entire, since its inception. I'd also like to thank um, our, the respondent, the Vice President for International Affairs, for coming uh, to respond to these remarks. But I'd also like to thank all of you for coming out on what must be the sunniest Friday afternoon in a very long time. Uh, and also at a time when I think Andy Murray is playing in Wimbledon. So I'm truly in your debt for uh, choosing to be here instead. I, I hope you won't regret it. Um, but it's a real pleasure to be back in London and to reacquaint myself with distinguished colleagues, students, and friends on this side of the Atlantic. Although my new professional role with the Carnegie Foundation, which is a, an absolutely wonderful place to work, Universities will always be magical places for me. When I was a child growing up in rural Ireland in a family with seven children, university really seemed like a dream destination, a place where Cinderella's could dance with ideas from all over the world and return transformed, empowered to leave their old shoes behind and step into any profession they chose. The university offered me a ticket into a new world, a social sphere not defined by religion or region, family income, race or gender, a world that held out a different model of belonging, an expanded vision of my own possibilities. It also offered newly complex and safely disputable vision of natural, national history, politics, international relations. I just love the way university made me doubt. It challenged all my preconceptions. I arrived at university schooled in a version of Irish history entirely at variance with the one I would encounter there. A worldview that attributed blame to Britain for most of Ireland's ills. The, ir the irony of it in light of my subsequent career is not lost on me. My education enabled me to make the journey from rural Ireland to where I am now, University at Dublin and Trinity College, then graduate school in America at Harvard. I was remarkably fortunate that this education was funded not by private income, but rather through competitive scholarships I was awarded along the way. University at that time was open to all who had the ability to pursue a degree, and it opened up the world to us. It's perhaps because of these beginnings that I tend to think of education as the solution to most problems. Tonight, I'm going to consider the question of how universities can help address the crisis in democracy. I'll be making various suggestions, but fundamentally, I'll keep coming back to the ideas of openness and mobility and transformation. Universities are, or certainly should be, models of what participatory democracy looks like. They bring people together from all walks of life to learn, reflect, debate, and think through how we move forward together on an equal basis. They are places of encounter, social fora as well as research institutes and libraries. The health of the university is in this sense already a major contributor to the democratic commons. I'd like, if I may, to plant an image in your mind. Universities are like rainforests in an overheated political landscape. They are vibrant, complex ecosystems 
that support diversity of thought, that can help clear the air of the toxic emissions of false rumor and support a cooler climate of reasoned debate. Just as we need to maintain rainforests at all costs to fight biodiversity loss and climate change, I believe that we need to maintain and support our universities to help fight democratic decline. But first, why is democracy declining? And what are the symptoms that we need to be checking when we pronounce it to be in failing health? When I speak of a crisis in democracy, I have in mind both the global decline in democratic governments and the national decline in democratic practices in the countries I know best. The heady days, not long ago, when American presidents could talk of exporting democracy around the world are gone. According to the VDEM Democracy Report of 2023, the advances in global democracy made over the past 35 years have been wiped out. And 72% of the world's population now live in autocracies. The report demonstrates that freedom of expression is deteriorating in 35 countries. Government censorship of the media is worsening in 47 countries. Government rep repression of civil society organizations is wor worsening in 37 countries. And the quality of elections is worsening in 30 countries. The, Econ the Economist Democracy Index of 2020 recorded similar results with the worst global score since the index was first produced in 2006. Now, you may really wish you were watching Wimbledon, but um, it's in this global context that we've witnessed a decline of trust in politics in both the US and the UK. We've witnessed increasing inequality and increasing polarization with the erosion of norms and political accountability. I'm going to spend some time considering these factors in turn, but of course they're linked problems that collectively undermine democratic structures as acid rain, increasing heat, and novel disease can undermine a tree. So declining trust in politics. In the UK in particular, I think one key factor in declining faith in democracy has been declining trust in politics and politicians. Sleaze and corruption scandals such as the VIP lane through which lucrative public contracts were handed to favored private firms have abandoned. Meanwhile, Partygate has clearly left a lasting bruise on public feeling and a sense of trust being abused. At the same time, some honors are bestowed and official appointments made that are so obviously matters of political favor and allegiance rather than earned by public service, qualification, or fitness for office. One should not be surprised when the public start to detect something rancid on the greasy pole and disengage. In 2021, an IPPR report warned that a decline in political trust is undermining liberal democracy in the UK. The poll carried out by YouGov replicated the historic Gallup poll first run in 1944 that asked people across Britain whether they thought politicians were out for themselves their party, or their country. In 1944, just one in three British people, 35%, saw politicians as merely out for themselves. While by 2014, that figure was almost half, 48%. And in the 2021 poll, almost two thirds, 63%, said they believed politicians were out for themselves. Now, this decline in public trust, of course, is not limited to Britain. In America, the Pew Research Center reported in 2022 that only two in 10 Americans say that they trust the government in Washington to do what is right just about always. 2% said just about always, or most of the time, 19%. Matthew Arnold, in his famous poem of Dover Breach, reflected on the decline in religious faith ebbing like the tide on the shingle where his speaker stands. He wrote, the sea of faith was once too at the full and round earth's shore, lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled, but now I only hear its melancholy long withdrawing roar. 
retreating to the breath of the, wind, of the night wind down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. It seems that we may be facing a similar moment of loss of faith, where many commentators hear the melancholy, long, withdrawing roar of a tide that is turning away from mainstream politics. As Robert Maynard Hutchin once argued, the death of democracy is not likely to be an assassination from ambush. It will be a slow extinction from apathy, indifference, and undernourishment. One of the key things that we have to fight, in my view, when we fight the decline of democracy is public apathy. People need to feel that they can change things. If they don't believe that government is anchored in public concern and committed to the public good, they will naturally turn to protecting only the people closest to them, seeking influence through private channels. In the anger and mistrust that many feel about politics and the effectiveness of their vote or their voice in driving political action, there has been increasing polarization with a visible move away from centrist or bipartisan politics and increasing normalization of what once would once have been considered extreme positions. In 2000, when York Heider, who had made comments that suggested sympathy with the Nazi regime, formed a coalition in Austria with the Conservative People's Party, protests erupted in Vienna and the EU imposed punitive economic sanctions. Today, Heider's party leads Austrian opinion polls. In 2019, in Spain, the far-right Vox Party, which is hostile to immigration, came third. They are currently ahead in the polls for the elections later this month. In France, Marine Le Pen and her National Rally Party score their most successful results in elections last year. Recent polls suggest they would win an election held today. Similar patterns are visible in Sweden and in Italy, where the current Prime Minister, Giorgia Maloney, is the leader of the Brothers of Italy, a Eurosceptical Conservative Party. In Greece, the term pacification has been coined to refer to the decline, to the decline from the 2010s of centrist social democratic politics, often accompanied by the rise of more extreme left and right wing alternatives. PASOK, once the centrist party of Greece, saw its vote share decline sharply from over 43% in 2009 to less than 5% in 2015. It lost out at the polls to Theresa, a left-wing anti-austerity party. In his poem, The Second Coming, Yeats refers to the center cannot hold. Certainly, we've seen that politically, the center is not holding in Western politics. Views once regarded as extreme are becoming normalized. The gap between opposing views of the world is widening. Now, time precludes my going into the descent of American politics into polarization, but as we know, what happens in the US reverberates around the rest of the world. In 2022, two thirds of Americans, 66%, believe that political divisions in their country had gotten worse since the beginning of 2021. More disturbingly, few saw things improving in the coming years. 62% expected an increase in political divisions. While only 14% of Americans said a civil war was very likely, in the next decade, 43% said it was at least somewhat likely. Where people foresee a future of struggle rather than adventure, they will be less likely to invest in bridges and more likely to invest in fences, or worse, guns. US institutions survived badly weakened, weakened one Trump presidency. It's difficult to have confidence that they would survive another. Now, my first initiative on becoming president of the Carnegie Corporation of New York has been to launch a Carnegie Fellows Program in which we will select 30 scholars each year and support them for two years as they conduct research on political polarization in the US and make recommendations on how it might be ameliorated. We will then use their insights to inform our future grant making. We badly need to rebuild the forces of cohesion and return to a more holistic community-based politics where people can listen, 
talk, and negotiate across party political divides and find common ground even as they respect each other's differences. The background to this increasing polarization of political views is entrenched and deepening inequality in most Western democracies. In 1989 in Britain, a rich person had 6,000 times the wealth of the average person. Now they have 18,000 times the wealth of that average person. In 1965, a typical corporate CEO earned about 20 times the salary of a typical worker. Now the ratio is 278 to one. Today, the US ranks towards the bottom of the industrialized countries in terms of social mobility. Young people, both in the UK and the US, feel the intense heat of the property market and the uncontrolled fire of global warming as threatening to scorch their life's ambitions before they have had a chance to bloom. It goes without saying that at a global level, of course, the scale of inequality is far worse. Where people believe fault lines hardening in financial terms, they are less likely to come together ideologically or to perceive their fortunes as linked. They may participate less often in democratic fora, both locally and nationally, whether it is joining a community board, a trade union, or voting in an election. The crisis in democracy is then, I think, underwritten by a growing sense that shared interests and mutual decision-making are less powerful than the actions and personalities of key players who hold the most valuable political cards and will play them according to the rules of their own making. There are signs in more than one country that norms of accountability that once governed democratic processes are beginning to be eroded. Politicians and lawmakers withdrawing from long established treaties and laws protecting certain human rights, seeking to strengthen their hand and weaken that of anyone who challenges their ruling. Client journalism, replacing open public interrogation of political parties by a free press and opposition parties. Often, the picture that emerges reflects the fact that many democratic institutions, such as America's Electoral College and Supreme Court, were created in the 18th century or earlier and are now like tall ships creaking at the seams to navigate the 21st century reality of digital democracy. The US Supreme Court, for example, is tied to no formal code of ethics. It is above such petty limitations. Where once there were gentlemen's agreements in politics, there need to be firmer and better laws protecting democratic rules and norms, limiting the power of individuals and cliques, regulating money in politics, and ensuring that all votes really do count. If not, democracy becomes a mere flag flown by a ship that many people seems rigged by pirates to whom they have no connection and who do not have their best interests at heart. So, now that I've thoroughly depressed you, what can universities really do in the face of this multifaceted crisis of democracy? Surely we are simply canutes before the rough seas of political power and the winds of global change. Well, my talk now, which I'm sure will relieve you, takes a more uh, optimistic turn. For I really do believe that universities have a greater ability than they realize to alter outcomes and secure positive change when it comes to our democracies and how they function. But it will require courage and determination and wherever possible, a united response to external pressure in order to leverage the full power of the sector for good. One measure of universities' power is what researchers have coined the diploma divide. Having studied electoral outcomes since the 1990s, they have concluded that educational attainment is increasingly the best predictor of how Americans will vote. If an American has a college education, they are more likely to vote Democrat. Those without a college degree are more likely to vote Republican. The more educated are also more likely to vote in the first place. Interestingly, exactly the same effect has been studied in France and Britain, in both general elections and in the Brexit referendum of 2016. 
In both countries, the college educated tend to swing towards more liberal views, while those without a college degree to more conservative views. One can posit many theories about why this is so, and of course, there are socioeconomic factors at work too. But financial stability and social class don't in themselves explain the diploma divide. Whatever the active ingredients in the mix, higher education is evidently a mind-altering substance. Certainly, education has a major effect on democratic outcomes. And in a way, it's not at all surprising why this might be so. Education exposes us to difference and ideally makes us more open to diversity of origin, of skin color, of belief, of religion, gender, and sexuality. It doesn't surprise me at all that college graduates in the UK voting in the Brexit referendum were on average keen for Britain to retain membership of the European Union. They were likely to have met people on an Erasmus scheme. Some would have benefited from the exchange themselves Many would have spoken or studied other European languages. Some would have received grants from European funding bodies or attended conferences with European partners. Their feeling about Europe was on balance likely to be more positive than that of those voters who resented governance from Brussels or who feared a dramatic influx of immigration from Eastern Europe. Now, before you cry foul, I'm not suggesting here that universities should pack in more students in order to obtain a particular political outcome. I'm simply noting that college education does have a potent political effect, and that one of its effects seems to be to increase participation in democracy in the first place. Another effect seems to be to increase liberalism in the broader sense of support for social inclusion. If we are looking to find a way back from polarization, extremism, and mistrust in politics, to build a new platform for openness in democratic thought where a wide range of ideas can safely be tested, then we could do worse than look to universities as spaces that have a proven record in fostering belief in the possibilities of political participation and civil discourse. When we make the benefits of a university education as widely available as possible through increased accessibility, digital outreach, part-time study options, and so on, we shrink the diploma divide, which seems such a potent source of mistrust and polarization. It's also very likely that we will be expanding the views of all those who have studied with us. That expansion includes equipping people to understand political ideas and systems and to participate better in democracy at both a local and a national level, whatever their political sympathies, with greater access to a wider range of ideas. Universities then are already key nurturers and preservers of democracy. They are, as I've suggested, complex ecosystems in which a very diverse group of people can find habitats that support their intellectual and imaginative growth. They are, from a, an ideas point of view, species rich. Just as rainforests are essential sites of biodiversity that help us to conserve and generate a host of life forms, some of them new to human eyes, so universities are essential sites that help us to conserve and generate living knowledge for the benefit of humankind. We need to preserve them, and more than that, to preserve their health, to resist attempts to destroy their long-term benefits for short-term profit. Just as rainforests sequester carbon, helping to support our atmosphere, removing toxins and making air breathable, universities too are crucial for supporting a healthier atmosphere in civil discourse based on facts, reasoned debate, and broad-mindedness. But to achieve this, universities need consciously to foster tolerance and encourage participation in their teaching, particularly their insistence on teaching respect for global histories, the legacies of peaceful process, protest, and the evolution of democratic thought. Universities can educate students in a wide arc of cultural traditions and a less Western-centric idea of development than was once the norm. They can train students to see issues from multiple perspectives, to practice shifting viewpoints, to argue from one side and then another. They can help students to develop their mental flexibility as well as strength. 
They can foster understanding of different political practices and consider how to improve democratic systems. They can teach students to dispute civilly and well. It's especially important, I think, that we don't confine debate on current affairs to the union, a space often dominated by political hacks and training, who prefer to argue in the binary Westminster model of attack and defense, and may well have learned a bombastic speaking style at school that plays to the pit. We need to be nimbler at creating more welcoming, less gladiatorial spaces, and better constructive models for debate where there is room for more shades of opinion, more diverse faces and voices to be seen and to be heard. Universities can also consciously in their learning practices help students gain experience of thinking together, collaboratively as well as individually, with emphasis placed in the teaching process and graded work on such teamwork. Students benefit from learning how to negotiate, how to make concessions, how to change their minds and enjoy doing so, how to find workable solution to a problem where many different actors have different priorities. Not merely scoring points, but building consensus. Students who have these experience in university will surely translate it into political participation post-university and arrest the escalating rise in youth disillusionment with politics. Universities can model democracy, the good society, the fair workplace, the well-run debating chamber, where everyone feels comfortable speaking. They can also model equal rights and fairness, particularly by being inclusive and committed to policies that allow access to higher education on the basis of merit and potential, rather than the advantages of social class and prior educational privilege. For universities to be the most diverse and supportive places they can be, they need to work hard on their access policies. I congratulate King's on its recent achievement in climbing to fifth place in the Social Mobility Index for universities in 2022, up four places since the previous year. It is so crucial to reach out to students from underrepresented backgrounds, as King's is doing with, through its K-plus program for over 16s and to guide those who may be anxious about their ability to apply to university through the admissions process from the earliest possible stage. The new frontier on equality in admissions is postgraduate study, where we need, I believe, to level a very bumpy playing field with some powerful steamrollers. These things don't happen on their own. It requires serious thought, addressing inequalities in existing systems, a variety of programs, and investment of both time and resources to support gifted students from the widest possible cohort. Universities also need to think about their hardship funds, how their infrastructure works for abled and disabled users, and how well their student services support students' mental health, as well as their other needs, which may include needs as parents and as employees in a part-time basis who work throughout their studies. They need to make it easier for disadvantaged students to get here and to get on once they are here. We need to see this as an investment in democracy in the widest sense. It is part of how we keep our institutions and public spaces properly open, fair and inclusive. If we want a more representative parliamentary democracy, universities are a really good place to affirm equality of opportunity and help create a more diverse cohort of leaders managers, and voters. As well as accessible, universities also need to be safe. They have a long and proud tradition of acting as sanctuaries for scholars suffering from repressive governments and political threats to their safety, and for those who have been forcibly displaced by war, famine, and other forms of social collapse. Many universities during the Second World War took in eminent scholars fleeing Nazi persecution. Touchingly, I recently discovered that some of the most generous American colleges in accepting Jewish refugee scholars were historically back colleges. Teachers who had themselves known discrimination and abuse stretched out a hand of friendship to those of a different skin color who had faced similar experience of repression. 
One of my most uplifting experiences at Oxford was watching the colleges and the Central University come together to offer support to Ukrainian students and scholars. We decided to offer up to 20 uh, full scholarships to Ukrainian students in the expectation that we would receive a handful of applicants. As it happened, we received over 800 applications and over well north of 200 of these were fully qualified. And we then went on to become a university of sanctuary. At Carnegie, we're supporting programs that help both Ukrainian and Russian scholars who are displaced by the war. Here, our main efforts are focused on supporting scholars to remain in the region in order to facilitate their return to rebuild the universities once the war has ended. I know that King's is proud to have been declared the UK's first refugee welcome university by Citizens UK. In recognition of your work contributing to understanding of forced displacement and the educational opportunities it offers refugees. This is another important way in which universities can address the crisis in democracy by resisting tyranny. We enable voices to be heard and research progress that would otherwise be silenced by, in this brutal fashion. And then there's freedom of speech. I believe that universities should be places where freedom of speech is practiced daily, where students and staff have the right to challenge one another intellectually in open fora and indeed to offend one another. There are naturally well-established legal limits to all freedom of speech, and I'm not suggesting for a moment that we violate them, but I do believe that we should facilitate the expression of all legal speech. Surely it is better to hear an ex extreme view expressed openly and for it to be challenged robustly in the debate that follows than for unpopular speakers to be counseled before they open their mouths or for zealots on whatever side of a democratic debate to speak only behind closed doors to a loyal following. That said, I'm disturbed by the attempts in recent years of the UK government to interfere in the democratic mission of universities by imposing a free speech czar. This interference smacks to me at best of mistrust and at worst of a power play. I believe that existing university regulations were perfectly sufficient and equal to the task of making good decisions regarding invited speakers. I fear the UK government's commitment to freedom of speech, and they're certainly not alone in this, is limited to freedom of speech with which they agree. This is, after all, the government that gave us the prevent legislation, which restricts speech antithetical to British values. And this is the government that issued new instructions to civil servants, effective from last year, requiring them to check the social media posts of all people invited to speak to government. If these potential speakers have been openly critical of the government, they are to be immediately disinvited. Politicians who will not hear a range of critical views from experts delivered in Westminster, in my view, have no right to talk down to universities about free speech. Democracy is a two-way radio between government and the public at large. If the erosion of democracy is to be arrested, universities need to make sure it keeps broadcasting in both directions. It is often the privilege of universities also to keep open channels of academic communication, where intellectual conflict, or, or sorry, where international conflict or dispute mean that other forms of diplomacy are narrowed or closed. Never underestimate the power of universities to continue intellectual and social dialogue that benefits democracy and diplomatic relationships. Brexit has threatened relationships between Britain and Europe in the worlds both of commerce and politics, but British and European universities continue to exchange ideas, colleagues, students, providing wildlife corridors that allow ideas to move frequently, freely and collaborative projects to thrive. They continue to hold conferences and high-level meetings to engage in vital work together. It is imperative that they continue to do so. And like many of you, I'm sure, I've been watching the press leaks in recent days about the prospects for the UK finally signing up to Horizon Europe and can only hope that the decision will be made to rejoin as quickly as possible. Major threats to future human peace and security transcend national borders. 
from climate change and biodiversity loss to invasive species, new diseases, microbial resistance to antibiotics, and hostile developments in AI technology. We need the open knowledge sharing and the trusted partnerships that universities provide if we are to respond quickly and effectively. As threats to peace and security are typically also threats to democratic function, universities should probably be regarded as circuit breakers for sudden global shocks. In strengthening their international partnerships and soft diplomacy, they protect our global commons. A good example of this is the COVID vaccine developed by Oxford during the pandemic in collaboration with global partners in business and in research, including the British-Swedish company AstraZeneca, research centers in Kenya and Thailand, test centers in South Africa and Brazil, and manufacturers in India. Universities are also reliable knowledge banks that stay open even during an international crash. They provide remarkable services, often at cost. So the COVID vaccine then in this regard is both a, a literal example and a metaphor. Universities can help to vaccinate people against disease, but also against the viruses of misinformation and hate speech. Universities as havens of research, reason debate, knowledge-based evidence, and planning for the future. This research serves many ends that actively support democracy. It can show us how best to alleviate poverty and enhance public health, explain voting patterns and democratic digital access to information. It can help the world to protect its energy needs, plot the likelihood of pandemics and other catastrophes and protect itself from their worst effects. In addition, of course, curiosity-driven research that belongs in and is nurtured by universities often has unintended but significant public benefit through technology through technological and scientific discoveries from batteries to radio waves, not to mention gene editing. Universities also investigate and disseminate the truths of history, of identity, of culture, making it less easy to spin false narratives. This has never been more important. Conspiracy theories are rife, and the digital attempt to confuse and manipulate the public with misinformation and conspiracy theories has been far too successful. As research jointly commissioned by King's and the BBC revealed in June this year, fully a quarter of Britons think that COVID was a hoax. Almost a third are willing to believe the great replacement theory, that white Britons are being replaced by non-white immigrants. And a similar number think that the World Economic Forum is an attempt to impose totalitarian world government. 19% of people in the survey said it was true or probably true that the UK government carried out the 2005 attacks on the underground in London in order to encourage support for war in the Middle East. The pernicious and widespread effect of this toxic rumor mongering via social media includes fanning climate change denial and equally worrying, spreading the message, apparently believed by one in seven or six million UK adults, that violence is a fair response to these governmental conspiracies. Often this information is a form of propaganda by another name. Within hours of the Notre Dame fire in Paris, a false rumor was circulating that it had been started by Muslims. The story was baseless, but it spread itself like a fire in flaming racial, inflaming racial prejudice, anger, and fear. And like me, you've probably read in recent days in France, we've seen the proliferation of fake images of rioters with guns and cars toppling from multi-story car parks being retreated millions of times all contributing to fanning the fames of fear. Investigative journalism is these days underfunded and media control is in too few hands. In many countries, journalists fear for their own lives when they report on politically contentious ideas. Even in the heart of Europe, it is possible for journalists to be murdered in cold blood. Journalism is further undermined when important stories, such as those about the climate crisis, simply don't run because they're blocked by editors as too risky, too downbeat, 
or are offensive to powerful patrons. At Carnegie, we have a program called Bridging the Gap, through which we fund the policy-relevant work of academics in an effort to ensure that public policy is informed by the best academic work available. We're also um, in supporting efforts to encourage American universities to follow their British counterparts by incorporating public impact into criteria for academic promotion. I believe that universities need to step up to help supply the gap in the digital newsstands with reliable, fact-based, long and short form takes on subjects of public importance. We need to get better at communicating our research on climate, on science, on new technologies to a wide public readership, not just in journal articles, but in accessible uh, digests and thought pieces. Funded research fellowships and partnerships with well-established and trusted journalists where evidence is properly peer-reviewed are also possible. I think universities have been in the habit of using their communications teams largely to disseminate information about their own achievements. Prizes won, goals met, new buildings opened. Nothing wrong with that, of course. But what if we regarded our media potential differently and became, instead of self-advertisers, trusted advisors, whom readers turn to for their weekly information. Without a party political agenda, audience figures to keep up, or trustees who are so liable to muzzle us, we can become staunch bastions of truth, holding the eroding line of balance and accountability, preventing the flood of misinformation from overwhelming the digital commons. Now, the issues I've discussed tonight together constitute a crisis in democracy that are obviously a great deal more than universities alone can tackle. Yet I do think that seats of learning have a key role to play in all the areas that I've described, and there is everything to play for. To return to that Robert Maynard Hutchins quote, the death of democracy is not likely to be by assassination or ambush, it would be a slow extinction from apathy, indifference, and undernourishment. In a way, this thought is actually empowering, because the more we care, the less likely that extinction becomes. The more we nourish its roots, the more likely it is that democracy will continue to spread and shelter us. Democracy isn't a totem. It takes no pleasure from our belief in it or worship of it. It won't go on working like a charm, whether we notice it or not. Rather, it's like relationships, something we have to com keep committing to. We make it afresh every day in each generation. We have to keep choosing it, advocating for it, strengthening it. We have to be politically present, actively engaged, even when things aren't perfect. Supporting democracy is also a continuous process. It is about being willing to speak up and be heard, about holding politicians to account, and improving the systems that force them to negotiate, to serve all their constituents fairly, to adhere to national and international rules and norms, to accommodate a wide range of public voices. Democracy is not just what happens in the polls every four or five years. It is government by the people on the principle that political authority stems from them, from the ground up, as a tree is held fast by its roots. So, I suppose if I have a final message, it is to the students and staff of this great university. I was asked to consider how, as a university, one addresses the crisis in democracy, and the answer is that one can't, but many can, we can, together. We are greater than we allow, wiser than we think, and stronger than we know. Our universities have knowledge that all governments need. Our research shapes the future. Our staff and students are among the best minds of every generation. We can advocate for the democratic systems we need to thrive. We can channel our work into preserving, promoting, and enhancing democracy. We can be models for the fairer and more representative society we want, and sowers of the seeds of the rainforest of the future, both academic and literal. These outcomes won't be handed to us. On a planet in crisis, Sudden unforeseen stresses, tipping points, and abrupt political changes are likely. 
But I believe it's part of our job as universities, conceived in its widest ethical dimension, to be ahead of the curve, to staunchly defend experts and the deep knowledge they represent, to keep the public well informed, the policy options visible, and the channels of communication open between the many different actors who participate in and benefit from universities, open, clear, fair, and tolerant. We must above all be democratic ourselves and true to the highest level of what the university represents. We are more than businesses, more than factories producing well-trained future employees or saleable patents or generous alumni. We are, as the etymology of the word university suggests, whole, entire, encompassing multitudes. We offer a space where all different forms of knowledge, all manner of different people from all over the world can come together to think, to study, to share, to write, to debate, and come closer if they and the system are working well, come closer to becoming their best selves. Inherent in that citizenship of learning and sharing knowledge and finding workable solutions together is the pathway of a more sustainable democracy. It is a path I believe we urgently need to find and to follow. Thank you again for listening and so kindly inviting me to talk to you this evening. Louise, thank you so much for this powerful talk. Thank you for the analysis, sobering at times, if not most of the times, but also for the positive messages about how we in the university can address the crisis in, in democracy. There is a, a lot to think about, and I'm sure there'll be many comments and, and questions. I, I was struck by your metaphor about the university as a rainforest as powerful, as important, as essential to the social life, political life, as the real rainforest is to life simply, but also perhaps as fragile, although not in danger of sudden death, as you, as you said. So um, thank you very much. So we'll have a, a session of uh, questions and answers or uh, comments are also uh, welcome. So we will start with uh, Fumi Olomisakin, our, our vice president. There will be a microphone in the in the in the room, so raise your hands, and the microphone will, will come. Thank you, thank you, Liviu. Now we understand why the room is full on a Friday uh, evening. Uh, you came here to listen to a lecture with a difference. And I hope you agree with me that you heard just the kind of lecture that sets us thinking, uh, that persuades us that as a university we are on the right kind of path, notwithstanding uh, a difficult path. But, but I, I wanted to first and foremost say thank you so, so much uh, for that generous lecture because of the level of detail uh, that you went to and the level of connections that you made between so many different uh, experiences. And so, and, and the way you situated uh, the kind of world that we face today. But I, I wanted to underscore a few points very quickly, uh, leave you. Uh, first is this notion of a serial breaker of glass ceilings. Uh, and you understand, one understands why. Uh, there's a reason why this is so. And to my mind, it's the pursuit of excellence as a scholar and as a human being. Uh, I reminded um, uh, Professor Louise Richardson today that I met her, or I first saw her at St. Andrews when myself and my colleague went to attend the graduation of one of uh, my mentees who has then moved on from St. Andrews to, um, you know, to other things and is a researcher at the moment. And what struck me at the time, uh, and now I know today there's a consistency in your narrative, what struck me was the way in which those of us, our family members, friends and supporters in the room heard distinctly uh, the message that the pursuit of excellence is one thing. So you can be a high performing student, but that story is incomplete if you're not a decent human being. 
I took that away from St. Andrews many years ago, and I myself uh, was very motivated by it, and it really resonated with me. But if, we now, if I now try to connect this consistency, the global nature of polarization, the tendency to gravitate towards easy sloganeering, if you like, and the preference to keep people happy with information that is untrue, uh, rather than to present them with hard, difficult news that happens to be true, uh, and provides the opportunity for collective solutions, which is the kind of leadership that I think you're telling us uh, we need to promote in the university space. That is the biggest challenge of our times. That is the biggest challenge for us as universities. Because the reality is that um, the declining trust in public office holders, in governments that we saw, that we've seen um, through these periods of polariza polarization, whether in the US or in the UK, the things that we have witnessed in the last period is something that has been transferred from the global north to the global south. And you begin to see, at least in the region that I'm more familiar with, uh, governments that peddle all sorts of narratives that are so false and have kept society divided. But in King's College, and in many parts of uh, our universities, of great universities in the world, the children of the polarizers, the children of the progressive Democrats meet. The children of those who are pursuing excellence and decency at the same time, uh, children of wealthy and of the poor meet for the for the very conditions that we promote social mobility. And that makes this a melting pot uh, at a point where legislation is also not on our side for the very reasons that we've heard. But what I also heard is a message of hope that the university remains the space in which we have to dare to promote the kinds of values that we've been talking about. Cultural co competency sits at the heart of it, but we heard many more this evening because the ability to see the world through the eyes of another, the ability to use education, the way in which we teach, the values that we convey, to use that to bring everybody into that pot uh, and as one of my colleagues will say, we have to go through the flames of hardship. Uh, it's like gold, going through the flames, the alluvium gets into fire, flames of hardship, and they come out purified on the other side. But to do that, we have to really speak truth to power and understand that the deployment of the knowledge in the university space that speaks truth to power because of the intellectual leadership that it requires to do that, because of the kinds of partnerships with the institutions that promote precisely the kinds of ideals uh, and the ideation that we translate back to society makes this particularly uh, difficult, challenging, but makes it particularly necessary for us to do. And so therefore, I really concur I think you have motivated us to see the university as the space in which we can speak back to the society of today and try to energize ourselves to make the world a better place, which is what Kings and various partner institutions are trying to do. I think this topic is timely. I think um, you have challenged us in different ways to return uh, and to not give up on those very ideas and ideals. Thank you so very much uh, for your lecture. Thanks a lot. Thank you for me. Um, I suggest that we collect a series of two, three interventions from the floor, and then uh, we give uh, Amy Richardson a chance to, to answer. So uh, there are several hands on this side already. We can start to the right, yes. Thank you. Then we move to the left. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, you uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Richardson, you've argued that universities are capable of and should be allowed to police themselves effectively in the matter of free speech on campus. How do you reconcile that with the treatment of Pro Professor Kathleen Stock at the University of Sussex? Can I borrow that? Sure. 
can i ask uh, thank you uh, this is very wonderful account of uh, lecture uh, so my question is uh, to the professor like uh, how a nowadays university is engaging with uh, promoting democratic value like if he can think uh, in in the developing countries like india and also where resistance is not all and if you resist for the issues then so you will be fined or you will be threatened by the university or the by the government where in india uh, i'm terribly sorry but i'm having trouble hearing you um, did you ask how i reconcile this with a country where protest isn't no i'm just relating uh, like how uh, nowadays university in one side they are not accommodating uh, the resistance the protest similarly in uk when uh, the students and faculties are resisting for uh, the regularization of tutor and the hourly pay of tutor and other things so how do the university accommodate this resistance issues oh, right. okay we can we can take one more one more question yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you so much uh thea tutberite phd student um actually my topic is very much related i think because uh, i'm studying five eastern european countries and may, like may i ask in what department uh, for studies department uh, analyzing pro democracy and rule of law reforms um, after the collapse of the soviet union why some of them managed to achieve more or less working democracy but some still struggle so far so my question is about uh, first question do you think only education would be enough for democratization and democratic development or uh, for managing crisis because if it would maybe russia would be democratic state as well uh, and another question is um, what universities could do to kind of help young generations who are coming here from developing countries to when they go back to be participated in politics much um, actively, not just criticize their governments, but be in government in the future and so on. How can we encourage them? What universities in the West could do to help them, people who comes here and having Western education, how can, can they use it or develop their own countries democratically. Thank, Thank you. you. So. Thank you for those questions. Um, on, on Professor Stark, um, if her treatment was, as it was reported in the press, um, uh, it was appalling in my view, but the fact that a single university doesn't um, adhere to the standards of academic freedom uh, that one would expect them to doesn't seem to me a justification for changing the regulation of the entire sector. Um, I can assure you she would not have been treated in that way at Oxford or at St. Andrews or at any other university that, that I worked with, assuming that the press coverage was accurate, which of course one can never be, be sure, but I assume you and I are relying on the, on the same public information and, and I thought it was appalling. Um, and I'm very glad she has been appointed to another university. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm afraid I was a little unclear on, on the direction of the second question. I, I th think it was about how universities in other countries accommodate different religions, is that correct? Um, again, I've, I've, my knowledge of universities is I'm afraid limited to three countries, or my uh, knowledge, I have enough knowledge in which I have the, the right to say anything, is limited to three countries, Ireland, England, and the US. So. Um, I really hesitate to, to opine on, on countries uh, about which I, I really don't know enough to, to comment, so forgive me if I don't. On the very interesting um, questions from the uh, PhD student, um, now clearly education is, as you say, education alone is not enough. Um, 
but it is worth pointing out that one of the first targets of authoritarian regimes are university, as Livlu knows better than anyone, um, as indeed do people who worked in, in universities in, in um, Turkey or a raft of other countries. Uh, very interesting to see how the academic community in Russia responded to the uh, war in Ukraine. Um, a few days after the invasion, the universities issued a fairly um, circumspect statement, um, which was clearly deemed to be totally inadequate by the authorities because a few days later, every university signed on to an extraordinary and deplorable document saying the universities were um, essentially the armies of the, of the president and the fatherland and so on, motherland and so on. Um, so education alone isn't enough, but it is, uh, I think it's a necessary condition if not a sufficient one. The other point about um, uh, uh, students coming to, the, to Western countries and then going back to their home countries. I mean, this is a classic case of private versus public good. I've had many conversations with many students who come here intending to go back, experience a different life here, and um, you know, on a personal level, you know, really grappling with uh, the ease of their life here versus the difficulty of life going back, and only the individual can make those decisions. And, I certainly would never judge somebody for the, the decision they made. Uh, I would tell you about a program we initiated in my final year at Oxford, which was funded by the MasterCard Foundation, which was to provide um, uh, fully funded master's degrees to students from the African continent uh, to come to Oxford for a master's degree for one year. And then the second year, um, they were required to do uh, what we called an Ubuntu year of service. So uh, we found them jobs related to their academic work uh, to facilitate their reintegration back into their, uh, into their continent, but also to facilitate their making a, a contribution. Um, that's one way that we can do it. But again, individuals might make a different decision. Um, so as teachers, I think all we can do is be as supportive as we possibly can to, to the individual decisions people make, but to respect their right to make whichever decision uh, they make. I, um, I, I've had some um, quite robust conversations with, very recently with um, uh, some students who are uh, members of the, who had received scholarships in the Mandela Rhodes Foundation, which again, we at Carnegie support. And they were a group of absolutely extraordinary African women. And they were all living in the US doing extraordinary things. And I asked them about, um, I said, gosh, but you know, we're contributing to a brain drain here. And they pretty well said, how dare you talk about a brain drain? She said, there are you know, hundreds of people in Africa as qualified as I am. And if a small number of us choose to leave, you know, that's our right. So this notion of a rain drain is something she would uh, see it as kind of neo-imperial almost. Um, but yeah, these are difficult, difficult questions. Thank you. We can take a series of uh, more questions. So I think there, there is one hand there just near you. So we can start there, yes. And then we move here, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Bobby Duffy, Director of the Policy Institute here at King's. And, and just thank you, Dame Louise, for amazing coverage and so many ideas and connections. I've got so many thoughts, but I'll try and limit it just to a, a couple. And then just one question would be good. So, so we run the World Value Survey here in the UK, um, which looks at these types of values and identities questions and compares it to other countries. And, and just, just three things that are clear from that is that um, we like each other as a nation, uh, the, the sort of the sense of culture war is massively overblown and we're quite connected and comfortable with each other. Our second, our problem is with our institutions much more than with ourselves. So that lack of confidence, that declining confidence in some of our key institutions is really important and particularly among Gen Z on key institutions like parliament, police and the press. But then the third point is that the principle, the principle of democracy is very attractive and in, 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 in fact getting more attractive to people. People think it's a, a very good system and that's increasing so that we're not really flirting 
with authoritarian regimes as some are kind of making out, it's certainly in, in the UK. So that's kind of a hopeful message. The second hopeful message uh, and second point is just that we, we definitely do see more conspiracies, but all the academic work looking at trends over time so it shows no evidence in increased belief in conspiracies uh, over the long term, over decades, which is interesting because you would think there would be more belief. But I think that is also a hopeful message uh, for us that people are not that easily shiftable with those types of stories. There are a proportion who are susceptible to belief in those things, but it's not really increasing, even with our terrible information environment. So I've got many thoughts on intervention, but just sticking to the role of universities, my main question is it seems to me that training young people in disagreeing well and avoiding that kind of chilling effect is one of the key things that we could and should be doing better and is not taken seriously enough or systematically enough in universities. Liv, you and I had the uh, pleasure of visiting the University of Chicago, um, which does have a very systematic approach uh, towards that. And particularly in the UK, I think we could do more. So one of my question is, is whether one of the possible benefits of a free speech director in the UK is that they don't just focus on regulation and holding universities to account, but they actually play a role in positively promoting uh, that difficult work that we need to do in uh, coaching our young people in disagreeing well, understanding the difference between offence, safety and harm, and taking them, giving them the tools to deal with those types of situations better in the future. Can we go ahead with more yes. questions? Or, uh, so, yes, and uh, after this round we will check, maybe there are questions from our friends, uh, colleagues attending online. Yes. Hi there. Uh, thank you very much for a really interesting talk. Um, I just wondered, do you think that it's university, university's job to promote democracy or to promote liberal democracy? Because those two aren't necessarily the same thing. I mean, um, democracy sometimes gives us outcomes which we don't like. And, um, so, and Westminster bubble types like me might um, say that the Brexit referendum was a case of too much democracy, not, too, not, uh, not uh, a lack of it. So, yeah, it's... Should universities be, be promoting a particular, a particular view of, of democracy and what democracy is? Thank you. Can we have the microphone in for the gentleman in the first row here? Thank you. Um, if I understood you correctly, you plotted the path between the, um, the more educated and the, um, so going through the college system, the more likely you are to, in the States to vote Democratic or Democrat or here, maybe you vote Labour, et cetera. And I think I understood you to mean that's a good thing. So university is playing a good role because it's ending up having people vote a particular way, which makes the universities, and, and I think that chimes with surveys about our university lecturers, professors, are they left or right? They, they are distinctly predominantly left. I should raise my hand, by the way, and say I'm left. So this is not a coming from the right. But given that's the case, might it not be that universities lose the authority to play a role here if they're just seen as... You get my question, I think. Yeah. Yes, Thank you. Absolutely. Well, we can take one more question and then can have a replies. Thank you so much. Uh, this is a really wonderful talk. And I'm afraid my question might be similar to the last one that was just asked, but I'm a graduate student at the University of Toronto in Canada, and I am all for universities fostering kind of open dialogue and promoting good faith communication. But I worry that actually universities are turning into echo chambers because there's a lack of the con conservative viewpoint in the faculty. For example, a very recent example of this was a group of graduate students that prevented a uh, professor from being hired on, you know, to a new, new university in, uh, uh, in the States because they had, um, I guess, unveiled some viewpoints of theirs that were critical or questioning a specific DEI initiative. Um, so yeah, what do you think about this? Is this a problem and how do we solve it? Thank you. Um, well, those last two questions are, are very similar and uh, all the evidence and all my experience suggests that universities are predominantly more on the left and, and I actually think that's a real problem for us. Um, and I think we need to be much more open. Again, we need to model the kind of behavior 
that uh, we want to see practice beyond the university. And I would love to see a much more stronger, more robust conservative voice in more universities. It does exist in some universities. Oxford would be one where there is a, a very strong, though probably undoubtedly um, minority, but very vocal conservative voice. Um, but I worry about this quite a lot, actually. And uh, the example you describe as, uh, again, somebody not being hired because of their views on EDI is appalling. And I don't think any university worthy of the name should behave in that way. Um, so I agree it's a problem, but we have to, again, the way to address it, it would seem to me, is participate actively engage and engage publicly, as I certainly have always done with people with whom I disagree very much. I, made a point of you know, volunteering to give, to introduce speakers with whom I utterly disagreed. Um, and people would know I disagreed because I, I wanted to make that point that we, you've probably figured out I'm more on the left than the right too, but I made a point of, of giving very generous in, in, introductions to um, people as a way of, of modeling that this is what universities should do. I'm not sure how much more we can do that than that. We should never not hire somebody because of, of their views. Any, any legal view that anybody has, I think, uh, we don't, um, should not be held against them, ever. Um, I'm unambiguous about that. And, and whether that reflects liberal democracy or democracy on, on your point, um, I'm, I think we could spend the night kind of arguing over what the finer distinctions between the two are. Um, so I would just say in the broadest possible sense uh, of a, a liberal consensus, I would advocate a democratic liberal consensus. Bobby has some fascinating data. I absolutely hope you're right that, um, that conspiracy theories are not more widely held than, than previously. One would think intuitively that um, social media would have uh, accelerated uh, and uh, ignited the contagion. One of the most interesting, it's, it's a variant on this um, reports I've read is by a group called on Common, uh, Our Common Purpose. And it was a study, a broad survey of Americans and what history they felt was appropriate to be taught in schools. And what this revealed was that there was about 7% on the extreme right and the extreme left. And um, you can imagine the positions that they adopted. But what it demonstrated actually that there was an, an enormous convergence in the center about what was appropriate to be taught. But the second main takeaway was that there was extraordinary um, misperception amongst Democrats as to what they thought Republicans felt should be taught in school, and amongst Republicans, what Democrats. So the Democrats thought Republicans didn't want to teach slavery, for example. Republicans, perfectly happy to teach about slavery. They thought Repub uh, Democrats wanted to teach their children from the age of four to experiment with genders or something. You know. And in fact, there was um, so enormous convergence, which again is a sign of hope. Um, if we can tackle the misperception that's held on, on both sides. So that's not inconsistent, but those are slightly different. Um, uh, but where, where you and I uh, probably do disagree, if, if, I, uh, if I interpreted your position correctly from your question about the, the, um, the free speech czar, I just think there is no evidence that the Office for Students, this bureaucratic behemoth, has contributed anything to the quality of higher education in this country. Uh, not a thing, I can't point to, I, I mean that genuinely, not as a polemical point. I, I genuinely, and I've, so, I've sought, I've even asked the head of the Office for Students to help me identify a single positive thing they've contributed and they've been unable to. So the idea that, the, that um, this czar would take it upon themselves to help universities design curricula um, I would love that to be the case, but I, I, I'd be suspicious that the Office for Students would take that approach. They tend to be much more heavyweight of regulation. Uh, but I would welcome, and I think most universities would welcome 
you know, assistance, support for workshops, uh, studies, how can we do this well? Because I, I, I think, you know, again, you, universities are trying to do this. They're grappling with how to do it. And uh, I think they would welcome help in doing it, but I, I don't have a whole lot of faith that the free speech, or that the Office for Students will do it for us. Thank you, Louise. Uh, I wanted to check, do we have any questions from online, yes? Questions? We cannot, can, uh, cannot hear. Can you hear? Yeah. Now yes, now yes. Okay, uh, so yeah, there was three questions and one comment. So we're gonna do it together as a <laughs> double act here. Uh, first question is from Zach Bove, um, who asks, uh, who says, um, you mentioned that universities' communications teams are used mostly to promote their accolades. As a King's graduate in communication studies, currently working for another university's communications team, this rings desperately true. How do you see this changing? What can we do to better support engagement and the sharing and understanding of research? Okay, the next question is from Wesley Teeter. Thank you for the spirited exchanges. How can we more effectively manage pressures on universities for job creation and the need for social inclusion and democracy? Next is a comment from George Kernohan saying, very interesting talk and great questions. I'm sure universities have a role in helping with democracy when we get it right in balanced debate, but I'm not sure if I am confident that we in universities will get it right in um, inverted commas often enough. And the last question is from Carol Madden, who says, given the commodification of higher education, how can we resist undue influence? For example, seeing students as consumers, um, no platforming and non-hiring. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, relaying the questions and also thank you for the, for the questions. I think if we, we would yes. like to answer some of them were comments rather okay. than questions. And, and then we can have probably one last round of questions, okay. not to abuse your time and your time too much. Uh, well, again, I think the second and fourth question were, were fundamentally the same. How do universities resist pressure, um, especially in this age where they're, they find a question, to, uh, questioner talked about commodification, whereas the other talked about the competing pressures between job creation and uh, social cohesion. Um, there isn't a, an easy answer to this, but this is the life of the vice chancellor managing, and I'm looking at another former vice chancellor in front of me who's nodding, this, this is our job. We have, to, um, we have to balance these pressures. We have to resist these pressures. We have to speak out for the, the real meaning of universities. This is what, uh, this is what we're there to do. So I, there isn't a, a pat answer of how you do it. You do it by voicing uh, your position publicly and by acting consistent with your voice and by continuing to make the case that it's actually in society's interests to take a broader view of universities' um, uh, universities role. This is not to belittle our role in job creation and so on, um, but that is just one small piece of, of what a university does. So, um, And universities are all about a long term. We've all been around a very long time for some of us. Um, and that gives us, I think, a perspective from which to argue for a long-term perspective on resisting these kinds of more immediate pressures. Um, how to change comms teams. I, you know, most of the people I've worked with in comms teams are actually passionately interested in the research that goes on at the university. And it's partly why they work in university comms teams as opposed to a bank where they'd probably be higher paid and so on. Um, so I think it would be quite easy to to, um, to encourage our comms professionals to, to pivot a little to, to being the, the trusted advisors. I, I don't see that as a challenge. I, I think, of course, like everything else, it probably comes back to resources. One might need to make the, the team slightly bigger or decide that some of the self-promotion was, was less necessary, but it is a competitive world, so I'm not knocking the, the self-promotion aspect of comms teams, but I have a lot of faith in our comms professionals at universities that they would really love the chance to, to uh, engage with the research and, and promote it. Thank you. Uh, John? Can I have a microphone? 
Yes, coming. Uh, yeah, John Gearson from uh, School Security Studies, I'm a professor. Um, I mean, thank you very much for your talk. As, as so many things, as Bobby referred to, that we, we, we could take forward. I mean, I work in a part of the university where we're uh, predominantly, but not in totally, focused on, on postgraduate education to some extent. So first of all, I'd just like to sort of highlight what I see as a mission of that education doesn't end with shaping a generation who then go left or right, but rather to actually be part of lifelong learning in a meaningful way. And in that respect, we can have a huge inf influence, I think, on policy uh, formation, delivery, um, and also, I hope, exchanging views um, internationally. Um, but if I can be a bit uh, cheeky and say, I wanted to reverse your, your title and ask you, uh, or ask, can democracy save the crisis in universities? Um, and I'll just use the case of Britain, but I'm happy for you to take two of your other case studies, if you like. Um, I think from our perspective within the university, um, we are faced with uh, a general election next year in Britain with two parties who are profoundly disappointed with higher education and the university sector in, in particular for completely different re reasons to some extent. They like our research, but they're skeptical of what we represent and, and what education has delivered, I guess, across that, that, that space. And it essentially comes down to our broken funding model, um, which in the UK is certainly in my lifetime, going to hit a crisis point. And I'm not convinced that our democratic system has any interest in uh, solving it. It's almost as bad as the social care crisis in the UK. But actually, if you talk, I'm sure, you, and you as a former vice chancellor, you know and you must spend your time. And I just wonder whether you can say anything positive about how we can get through this looming crisis. Because I just don't believe the political parties and I'm not talking about extremists at all, the mainstream political parties are not sure what universities are for, I think, at the moment. Thanks. Thank you. If you can pass the, the mic just down the, down the row here, yes? And then we'll have one, one last question. And one last question. And then I, I'll keep my promise not to abuse anybody's time. Yes, please. So thank you so much for that range of uh, issues for us to address. Um, but I just wanted to look at some of the inconsistencies that universities are capable of. And we all have splendid mission statements and global challenges and so on. Um, but some of those we don't really live up to. I mean, our broken funding model, for example, means that we are bringing uh, wealthy Asian, Asian students to pick up the pieces. And this is not either green or inclusive. So, uh, and we talk about inclusivity and diversity all the time, of course. And then the other point was in talking about communicating our research, and I absolutely agree that we need to communicate our research, but communication is a two-way process. And it's not about telling people um, and giving speeches and sending out information. And I think if we can change that language more to engagement with the public, especially the public, because the government doesn't listen, so it better be the public. Because that was exactly what you were alluding to when you were talking about pedagogy and what we're doing, trying to do with students. We're trying to bring them into being capable of not just understanding, but also doing. So can we do that, do you think? Thank you. Uh, there is Rata, yes. <clears throat> Hello, um, thank you for a very thought-provoking um, lecture today, um, Professor Richardson. Um, I'm Radha Parumal, I am a postgraduate researcher, PhD student in the School of Education, Communication and Society. Um, I'm, it's, it's almost a, a provocation, but also possibly a comment and a question that I've got for you, or well, several actually. Um, I'm gonna start by just sharing very quickly. I mean, I came to this, I wasn't born in this country, um, I came here as a teenager in the 1980s, and I have navigated my way through further in higher education. I'm a PhD student now, and I'm very fortunate to be funded um, on a research project that enables me to ask some, what my father would call difficult questions about the higher education sector. What I want to say is that this position and situation that I'm in is too rare. 
And I don't see enough of that among the doctoral cohort, not, not just in King's, but also at other institutions in the higher education sector. So I think I'm developing into this, this, this idea that I've got, which has to do with to what extent can we operationalize um, ways to attend or approaches to attend to the crisis in democracy in our universities. And I'm going to allude to that dreaded R word that you mentioned at the start of your lecture, a form of light touch regulation. How do we, how do we instill concepts like democracy and activism perhaps, which is something that I kind of heard kind of mentioned obliquely perhaps in some of the questions and conversations that we've had um, this evening. How do we embed those concepts and ideas within higher education, taught um, postgraduate and also postgraduate research curricula, interactions between tutors and academics and students that perhaps can strengthen universities' positions as kind of role models and modelers of democracy in society today. Thank you, Rata. There is one last comment or question. Uh, thank you. My name is Alfred uh, from the African Leadership Center. And I must actually start by saying I'm actually a beneficiary of uh, Carnegie uh, funding that has seen me rise through higher education for my master's and uh, now PhD in King's. So I think there's still hope. But echoing the two questions, I think I grew up in a country uh, in Kenya where universities were sites of a progressive change. And uh, it gave birth to the intelligentsia who actually um, went to change society. And in my view, I think going forward is sort of echoing that space. I feel that the world hasn't lost hope. Uh, there is still a chance where universities can be sites of the change that the society needs. So I don't feel uh, less hopeful, I feel hopeful. and. Um, encouraging you all to also be in that way and contribute in that way, you know, as scholars and also practitioners and outside people, you know, to see the value in that. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you very much. L let me add a few <clears throat> comments, and I'm, I'm going to, to do this from a partisan perspective, if I, if I may, and uh, let me explain what I, what I mean by that. It is very interesting to listen to, to the conversation now after your talk. I think your ideas resonate differently when it comes to the question, how can universities help address the crisis in, uh, in democracy? They resonate differently depending whether those who are responding are present vice chancellors, former vice chancellors, future vice chancellors, perhaps students, academics, heads of schools. So, you know, this question involves in a way, or the answer involves who is the university in, in that regard. And my partisan position is, you know, a little bit like my, my, uh, my, my colleague uh, also, what can a school of education do, you know, in order to help address the crisis in democracy? and. Now, I can expect, speaking for my own school, that there will be some PhD dissertations, perhaps uh, you know, some modules that will follow uh, your insight here, and I promise not to turn to you, at least not now, for funding for, for, uh, for, for those. But I think in terms of research in higher education, we are very much behind. And uh, you, know, you mentioned very eloquently how universities have both the duties and the means to contribute to addressing the crisis in democracy. But, and there is no research about they do, they, whether they do that or not. But I would say if we look at, at the strategic plans of universities in the UK and on the European continent, mainland Europe, there will be nothing about that, about addressing democracy. I think it would be interesting to have a PhD dissertation or, or more about it. There's no research about trust in higher education. There is a lot, and you mentioned it very eloquently, trust or lack of trust in politics, in the, in the public life. And then there is very little research about recent developments, new ideologies, political developments, the ones that you mentioned, political narratives, and how they influence higher education. I was thinking, listen to, to you talking about the diploma divide. Uh, I hear more and more often 
people who are promoters of massification saying higher education has failed us. In particular, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the big promises of higher education, mobility, uh, you know, the social elevator, it has failed us. Therefore, we should stop believing that higher education is good, that more people should go to higher education. OECD is now saying, forget about it. Fewer people should go to higher education. Our government here, if I may say like that, I'm not a citizen of this country, uh, is also advocating for, you know, there's no value for money in higher education. So is there a change? And I, I am the one using for the first time this term, you know, a kind of a discourse of demassification of higher education. And that there's no, uh, there's no research on, on that as well. And my, my very last comment, there is more and more research about freedom of speech, academic freedom, I, I should say, uh, that's different from you know, a few years ago when, when we met. But uh, this, this research is incipient. And if we look at the, uh, the case of uh, um, the higher education, freedom of uh, speech bill, I think what strikes me is how there is so little talk about the long-term dangers that come with this law. So it's not only now, but long-term, and in particular resulting from the fact that the law basically misconstrue academic freedom as freedom of speech alone. As if, you know, talking about the results of your research is the only important thing and choosing the research question is less important. But that is a part of academic freedom. The right to decide what you learn as a student within limits, of course, is also a part of academic freedom. So academic freedom is a precondition for the production, transmission, dissemination, use of knowledge, not only for talking, about, about knowledge, and this is what, what the law does, and there is no research about it. So, uh, you know, I, I, I will end by saying now, I, I hope everybody understand why not only I didn't try to answer the questions that I asked at the, the beginning, but I limited myself to just a few uh, questions because we got so much insight and, and wisdom and, and, and answers, and you know, I can promise you that uh, at the School of Education, Communication and, and Society, we will keep reflecting on this and perhaps following up on, on some of your suggestions. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Would you like me now to end or to yes, respond to can, these questions? Yes, you can do whatever you oh, can well, respond. I, no, I just, Freedom uh, of speech. Yeah. No, no, I, I, I've just been people politely ask questions. I, uh, that was such a wonderful speech. I hesitate to say anything afterwards. That was, um, but as a courtesy to those who pose those questions, I fully agree with you on lifelong learning. So I didn't mean to preclude that in any way. On the, um, on the funding crisis that a number of people have raised, uh, maybe I can be a little more sanguine because I'm now not running a, a university, but universities are always in a funding crisis. And I don't know any university, I, I don't know what country has gotten it right. Um, certainly it's not right in the US, you've probably been following the difficulties over um, well, for a whole raft of reasons. There's so many things wrong with the US, um, US education, financing of the US educational system. And I know that the uh, costs are not fully borne by, uh, covered, the costs of education are not fully covered. So, um, but in the broader scheme of things, taking the long sweep, you know, universities will navigate this crisis. We come out the other end, you know, if you're looking at the history of some of the universities I've been in, I mean, you know, where I'm, I'm thinking of the visitations in the, during the course of the Civil War. So the government of the day, whether they were royalist or, or not, came in and simply removed all the faculty who disagreed with them and um, killed some of them, but most of them were just chased away. Uh, and then they went through this ping pong uh, as the course of the Civil War evolved. So but compared to that, the current crises are, are in universities are really quite modest. We'll, we'll figure out this way through the funding model. And in the meanwhile, bringing in uh, international students to help pay for, uh, cover the costs, is a typical example of the ingenuity of universities figuring out a way to deal with the underfunding of universities. If I had my way, of course, uh, education would be the number one priority of, of uh, a government. The fact that it is so low on the uh, horizon of both major parties is a problem for us. And I think that it's more than a problem for us. It's a, surely a cry to action for us to get out there because 
all, vast majority, overwhelming majority of these MPs, with the notable exception of the current Secretary of State for Education, but um, went to university themselves. Their children are going to universities. They know about universities. I think the problem is they just take universities for granted and they have the notion that universities are actually pretty rich and will muddle through regardless. I think um, everybody who cares about universities should be lobbying their MP about the importance of ensuring that the funding at a minimum continues and ideally is increased. Um, but it, as compared to historical crises, you know, we'll get through this one. Um, uh, let's see, sorry. Um, there was a couple about the funding model. There was how do we inculcate activism was in essence what you said. Again, we, in a sense, that was what I was trying to talk about, the, the, the necessity that we do that, that we, um, but people will only get active, it seems to me, if they see the results of their activism, see that they can achieve something by being active. And that's why, as university leaders, I think we can prove the uh, value of activ activism by responding to the activism in our own community. It doesn't mean we, we concede every contested point, but that we make it worth people's while. People's while. But one of the the problems that I think is one of the big problems that I assumed you were going to talk about but didn't was actually uh, the plight of the early career researchers in the, the current system of funding universities because I worry that people will not become an academic. I don't think I'd have become an academic if I were at my stage in life in this, um, wherever it was, 30 years ago. Um, we need to make it easier for uh, early career researchers to get permanent jobs, not to be living from ground to ground for, for decades in some cases. Um, and that's the area of funding of universities that I think is most neglected by the government and most needs to be addressed. And research institutions like this need to be at the forefront of making the case for changing how we, how we fund our research and thereby improve the lot of the early career researchers. Um, and you talked about, well, I think I'm largely going to agree with that. Oh, you raised the issue of, of access to, to education, uh, to third level education. Uh, again, the people who, who ask for um, reducing the numbers go to, going to universities are generally people who have benefited from universities themselves. And until we as a society develop a vocational alternative that is attractive to people, um, universities is the best chance. The evidence is simply overwhelming that going to university increases your, your uh, lifelong uh, earning potential. Um, yeah, the evidence for that is quite aside from the fact that that should not be why one goes to university because the ancillary lifelong benefits of a life of learning um, are priceless. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Louise. I think we can end on this uh, positive uh, message. University is still the best chance in, in, in many situations. I don't want to take back what I said earlier, that your thoughts resonate differently with um, uh, different people here. But I would just add that they resonate with all of us and probably for long. So I want to thank you very much. This was a memorable talk uh, indeed. And I am, I am very grateful that, uh, that you that that you are here and spend this um, evening with us. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.